Right, of course. Hi, y'all. I am Reagan. Uh, you probably get a lot of emails from me. I am the gallery exhibition manager. It's nice to kind of put some faces to names. I'm just used to seeing names and names alone. So hello, everybody. I hope all is well with y'all. Welcome back to We'll Talk with Artists. I hope that everybody has a really good time. These talks are very successful and very interesting. I'm glad to be able to host one. Um, for those who do not know Will, he is a fantastic photographer. He is also a heart, art historian who graduated from, um, graduated from, retired from National Gallery. So without further ado. Graduated is fair. <laughs> Without further ado, here's Will and uh, Mary Ellen Carson, Car Crosley, and I hope that everybody has a wonderful time. We're going to get started, and uh, I have been charged, among other things, with uh, selecting the people that will be interviewed. And what I've been trying to do in the selections is choose members of the MFA that I think uh, are not just fine artists, but will make lively and interesting conversationalists. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to know Mary Ellen uh, because she's on the faculty at the Severn School up in Severna Park, uh, where my son and daughter-in-law attended uh, high school. And um, I got to know her as the juror for their annual student art show, which she was coordinating. Um, so, uh, I am a great admirer of her work and of her uh, as a teacher uh, and educator. So let's just go right ahead. And um, Mary Ellen, I think you have a very interesting background that led you to where you are today. So it's kind of a conventional way to start one of these conversations, but why don't you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about how you decided to be an artist and how you prepared yourself to be the artist you are today. Okay, well, thank you, Will, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I think probably, uh, you know, without, <laughs> uh, I, I guess the best place I could start is that, you know, I was one of those kids who always drew and and my my older brothers told me that they always remember me lying on my stomach and just drawing all the time and um you know when the time came when i was in high school uh, my father was like what do you want to do what do you want to study and and i said well um i said i i want to draw every day and i go i don't know what i really want to do but i want to draw every day and my dad said that he goes, well, I don't think it's a good idea that you, you major in, in art. And he goes, as a woman, he says, I don't think that's a good idea. And my dad said, the reason being was that he felt like I might end up in a situation where I would always be beholden to a man, if not him, oh. someone else. And so he said, I want you to be able to make your own choices in life. And he goes, you know, you've always liked science. I was particularly fond of, that's why Maurice's comments in the beginning really interested me. I've always been fascinated by the natural world and by biology and, and things. And he's like, you like science? And he says, and you know, you love art. And he goes, why don't you try architecture? He goes, cause it's kind of like the two put together. So, um, so I, I, I went and my father took me uh, to his alma mater. He went to Catholic university and he actually taught there. Um, and he said, why don't you come and look at an architecture jury? And I thought what the students were doing was really fantastic. And um, so I majored in architecture and I ended up practicing architecture for about seven years. And, um, but I was always the architect's artist. I was always the person doing the renderings in the office and things like that. And then finally one day, I, I, I just got this bug on. I just started thinking about, you know, maybe I could actually do this. Maybe I could actually have my own business and, and go on my own and, and, and freelance. And so um, and at that point, I had actually had a bi field biologist approach me and asked me about illustrating some of his work. And it literally was one scientist after another, one architect after another. And pretty soon my day job was starting to interfere with my <laughs> moonlighting work. And so I had to kind of take a, make a decision and take a plunge. And so in my tiny one bedroom apartment, I started my own business and, and, I, and I went into doing scientific and technical illustration. How and long did you do that kind of work, both architecture and the, um, illustration work 
before you started to think about exhibiting your work as a fine artist? I'm not oh. saying serious things. I'm just, you know, we do tend to make those categories. Oh, absolutely. That's a, that's a really great question because when I was doing illustration, I, I'll be honest with you, when I was an architect, I was like, oh, I've never, I, I would never try to put my work in a gallery. That's because also too, it was always somebody else's narrative. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the work that uh, the work didn't start with me. I guess that's the best way to say it, or with an inspiration that I had. I was working from someone else's script all the time. And for a long time, I enjoyed that. Um, and, and then it was kind of interesting. What happened was, um, long story greatly condensed, I, I did that for about, about five or six years. Um, I eventually had two other partners and we had, uh, we, we ended up partnering up because we did a book together and then found out that we could actually kind of market ourselves a little bit better as a group. We did that. And then, um, my son was born <laughs> and I got far more interested in being a mom and, and doing that. And, um, and it was really interesting because by that time I had also, uh, done some visiting teaching. A, a, a dear friend of mine who was uh she, I, she was at the Friends School in Baltimore for over 30 years and she kept inviting me into her classroom and then she, you know, and she was like, why don't you come in and teach the kids about Greek architecture? Why don't you come in and teach them about scientific illustration? And um, why don't you, you know, oh, why don't you go and work for my friend and go in for another day over there? And so pretty soon I had been doing a great deal of, of um, I, I had a couple of years of visiting teaching under my belt after I, before I really even knew it. And, and I did get tired of, after my son was born, I got kind of tired of what I used to refer to as the game. Uh, you know, it's always, you, I got, it, it got very tiring to like worry about like, I couldn't enjoy the work because I was always worried about getting the next job and doing that. And Let I me was, interrupt you right here, uh, Mary Ellen, yeah. because what you have just sketched out leads me to think of what, I believe is one of the fundamental questions about an artist that has commercial success and then gets into education. You know, a lot of, we all know, a lot of artists get into education because that's the reliable check uh, that comes <laughs> in. And they don't have to do what Mary Ellis is talking about in drawing up business and, you know, keeping a flow of income and all of that. So my question is, is gonna come in a second, but first I wanna tell a personal anecdote because I find it interesting in these conversations, how people come to be an artist in such different paths. When I was in a public high school, junior high, senior high, we as junior high school students had to take art. And I was one of those boys that sat in the back of the room and took those big rubber uh, rectangle erasers mm -hmm. <laughs> and threw them at the art teacher when he sketched on this drawing pad. <laughs> You can imagine our relationship was not the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only took one semester of art in high school. Um, actually, that was all that was available. Um, yeah, well, so it was kind of amazing. It, that sort of speaks to, and I think everybody who is at this talk right now knows, I mean, it, it's, I mean, the you know, the, the thing that people refer to as that art thing with you or your art thing, you know, yeah, and all, they, yeah. they don't, if you don't, it's, it's not this thing that I can put on a shelf and pretend isn't there. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's part of who I am. And, and well, so I that's think that's really where my question was going before I digressed. Uh, and that is of the three things. And by that, I mean, you're an architect, you're a commercial artist, uh, uh, your teacher, actually four things, and a quote unquote fine artist, is one of them more rewarding or meaningful to you than any of the others? Oh, absolutely. I, I think the thing for me is I'm, I'm grateful every day that I ended up in education. Um, it, it's also a great place for people who are overeducated and perpetual students to hide. <laughs> 
<laughs> I can identify with that. I'm, I'm like forever reading. I mean, like, I, I, like I said, like when Maurice like starts talking about mushrooms, I'm like, really? I'm like, I want to know, you know? <laughs> and so I, it's like, I'm like forever curious about, about things. And, and thing, and I think that, uh, you know, um, being with young people is, I, you know, for me, teaching constantly recharges my batteries. It doesn't deplete me. Um, and, and their ideas and their bravery, um, the way they just sort of dive in, you know, as, as we get to older in life, you know, um, you get comfortable and you get less inclined to make yourself uncomfortable. And, and, you know, if you stop making yourself uncomfortable and you stop challenging yourself as an artist, I, I mean, that's just the end, it seems yeah. to me. I, well, it's I, like you have to be pushing constantly. I, I think that's very well said, and, and I love your enthusiasm about saying it. And I would agree with you that as a museum educator, I found that it was a way to, I felt, make this very specialized knowledge that I had as a doctorate uh, of American art history. Um, to share it with people that didn't have that kind of interest and they in some ways were more interesting to talk to about art than my professional equals because and I'm putting in a plug as an older person here and I see there are a few others in the audience it was often an older person who had some whole other separate life and career who would ask the most probing question you know because they weren't thinking in those kinds of boxes so Old people can be the same stimulation as young people, but they just have a few more resources, in, uh, I guess. So let's jump ahead then to the next part of what I hoped we would talk about and that people would enjoy hearing more about is you are essentially a graphic artist uh, in the work that I know of yours, okay? And some of the things you've been showing at the MFA exhibits uh, in recent years are kind of complex, uh, printmaking uh, techniques. So can you briefly describe things like, um, oh, what's, I can't, now I'm. The wood, I think we talked about the woodblock reduction. Yes, the wood, well, the reduction woodblock, I think that's the term that you mm -hmm. use to describe them. Yeah, yeah, can you explain that and maybe monotypes if we have time? Sure, I, I mean, so the works that are behind me are both reduction prints. Um, everything that I do um, begins with field sketching. I, I, I am an avid biker and walker, and I take my, I mean, thankfully, taking your camera with you is easy now, right? Because you just have your cell phone. And, um, but I also take my sketch book with me. I have a little pack that I carry of watercolors and, and uh, my sketchbook. And, you know, I, and my husband knows when I go for a walk, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a good thing that I have my cell phone because if I'm gone for more than two hours, then he calls me, but he certainly <laughs> expects that I'm not going to be returning for a little while. And, um, and so usually I go out, I draw, um, you know, I draw from life. Um, everything that you've seen behind me, even the mouse, um, I, I, I drew from it. The mouse I actually found under a flower pot in my backyard. I'm an avid gardener too. And, um, and so he very conveniently just stayed there for a few minutes and I was able to take some pictures and do a quick sketch of him and he ended up turning into an etching. Um, can you grab but, the mouse and hold him close enough so that we can see him? Yeah, there he is. <laughs> so, little, can you put it just a little closer? To, there we go. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> there All right. Are there um, are there any artists from the history of art that you're familiar with that have inspired the way that you approach your subject matter? Well, there are. I um, I, I I actually read a lot. I'm I'm, I'm huge into reading uh, letters and journals of artists. Um, so I've read all of Van Gogh's letters. Uh, I really enjoy um, Rilke's letters. Actually, he's a poet, but he was actually Cezanne's secretary for a while. And there's a beautiful series of letters that Rilke wrote his wife and 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 um, their correspondence back and forth. She was a painter, um, and so that that I love reading. Uh, uh, those are two of my favorites. Um, the journals of 
Odilon Redan, I really enjoy. Um, I, I love a lot of the Japanese masters, probably looking at my work, it's not too surprising um, that, that, uh, that, that some of those are, that's been influential to me. Um, I, I think though the one name that always pops up in my head is actually kind of my my lifelong sort of research project is a name that most people don't know and um, and his name is William Hamilton Gibson and years ago um, I did a uh, I, I did a series of illustrations for um, the Maryland Natural History Society and um, I did them pro bono because I was very good friends. Um, with the two people who started, who actually started the society and the museum up in Baltimore. And um, as, a, as a gift, they gave me a book called Sharp Eyes by uh, William Hamilton Gibson. And he was one of these men who lived, he was born around 18, 1840 or so and lived um, to just to the turn of the century, just before the turn of the century. He didn't live very long, unfortunately. Um, but he was one of the illustrators in the golden age of illustration and uh, in the United States. Uh, so you can kind of think about him, even though he wasn't part of the group, uh, Chad Sford um, and with Howard Pyle, but he was all kind of in the same in the, in the same genre, it, it, a visual genre, if you think about that. Um, and he did incredibly detailed uh, etchings and uh, block prints and drawings. And uh, he would actually would not have his work engraved. He would do his own engraving um, as well. And uh, he didn't come to art until a little bit later, which was one of the reasons he was kind of an inspiration to me uh, that way. And then when he did, he just sort of kind of went whole hog on it. And he was a lecturer um, as well as he wrote, I think he wrote like 18 books and they're all what I would put as sort of backyard environmentalism like you know mm -hmm. these are the animals in the so planet he's an artist that inspired you greatly but most of us even i i if i've yeah. seen his work and i'm yeah. very familiar with the um chad ford uh group of artists and the uh, american illustration movement and i can't connect that name with an image you know? I know it's it's really amazing. Do you know when he died, his obituary was bigger than Charles Dickinson's obituary in the New York Times. Uh -huh. He was he was a pop culture figure, which is really bizarre, and it goes to speak to like the fleetingness of fame, right? I mean, like who knows who this guy is, and he was the yeah. biggest thing, and and he was a huge illustrator. He did a lot of Harper's illustrations. Well, how about like the that. people that are sort of you know the the iconic names? in the canon of Western art. Are there, we had an interesting conversation just the other day, so this is a little bit of a prompt, but is there anybody in that canon that most of our listeners would recognize that has influenced you? Well, probably, um, I, I would probably say that um, John Singer Sargent would be one. Um, I, 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 there's, there's something, um, also uh, Henri Fantin Latour, uh, I, I just, uh, and also Lepage, uh, they're all oil painters, uh, and, and, uh, but what I admire about their work the most is, uh, there's, there's a painting in the Freer Gallery, um, by, uh, by Sargent and it's kind of a it's sort of one of my spiritual artistic pilgrimages I go and see this painting every once in a while and it's called On the Loggia and it's just two women mm -hmm. sitting you know on a porch in Italy somewhere or in Spain and uh, there's a shadow that he painted from the that's the woman one of the women has a very broad brimmed hat on and there's a shadow that he painted over her face and it's one stroke and it's the perfect geometry, the perfect hue, the perfect value. It's, it's like, and I mentioned Rilke before, it's like great poetry when the, the right word is, is there. And, and, and when I think of those painters and I look at their painting uh, and I try to do that in my drawing, um, it, it's, it's, uh, when you when you just find that word, find that right 
movement, you know, uh, and, and, and there's a, there's a kind of, um, there's almost a kind of yogic quality to it because it has to do also with like the movement of your hand as well as how you manipulate the, um, how you're manipulating the medium. And, and, you know, there are times, you know, my husband's an artist as well. And one of the things we talk about is that sometimes when you get into that sort of state of flow, um, you know, that they talk about, uh, that scientists talk about, like they can actually tell when your brain waves change, you know, that you're in that yeah. perfect concentration state, that you actually feel like there's something, it's bigger than you that's going on to the canvas, like that you're actually a little more open to what's going on around you. And, and, and that's a wonderful feeling. And, and I think great works of art that inspire me, it, I, I, I sense that in them for that's what part of what draws me to them is that that that, that sense of flow that it's just it's one dash one brush stroke. It's, it's interesting that you describe it that way and I would describe it for myself slightly differently but I think it's just different words to describe the same sensation and I think many artists would agree uh, and express it in their own way. For me it's I'm terrible at rem remembering music. I love music but sometimes when I take a photograph, I don't usually recognize it at the moment I click the shutter. Mm. But when I see it on the screen, or sometimes, you know, when I even see it on the little view screen on the back of the camera, I think, you know, there's something that's resonating. It's almost like a musical note mm -hmm. or the music of the spheres, you know, if you want to get really spiritual about it. So that's great, but I'm going to throw a name at you because okay. when I first became familiar with your work as an artist, this immediately leapt to my mind. Oh, I'm nervous. <laughs> Albrecht Durer. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm, I'm beyond flattered. <laughs> no, when, you, when you pulled up the mouse, uh, I was surprised that you did that because I always associate your work with uh, his big clump of turf. Yeah, that's that, yes, that's a whole universe to me. <laughs> and, and his hair, the, the hair is sort of the same thing as what you did with your mouse, you know. Um, I, I love that piece, by the way. I, that didn't come to mind immediately, but I, I you know, it actually, it was at National Gallery. It was quite a while ago. They had the Durer exhibit, and it was there, and I, I was probably borderline rude how long I stayed in front of that one, or, you know, because it was a very crowded thing, and I'm like, I just want to look at this. Can, can we just be together for a while? You know, me and the, and the, and the turf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Well, that's wonderful, and I'm glad that there was a connection that you felt, too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, with that. And um, I don't know you that well, but I cannot imagine you being rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I have to say, maybe if I didn't have my dark chocolate for a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk about a little bit more about the process. Can mm -hmm. you sort of quickly describe what a reduction woodblock is and the steps yeah. that you take to produce it? So what you basically do, like I said, I begin with you know, just plein air sketching. And then those sketches, I basically reduce down to very graphic line drawings. And by graphic, I mean, it's just really, there's no value, very strong line work. And I'm, I'm, I really, uh, I'm, one of the things I strive to do is create what I call a hierarchy of line. So, you know, thicker lines come forward, thinner lines recede. So I try to create this kind of hierarchy of line uh, within, within the work. And then that gets transferred onto a wood block. And what you, uh, what you do is first, and you can see from here, the first, the first color that was, the first color that was printed was just the plain block just the completely blank block um, and it was it was the uh, the Naples yellow that that was printed so that's underneath there and then you put the drawing you have to you have to wipe the block and then let it dry and then you put the drawing on top and then you decide what the next color is and for this the next color was um, was to do the large blue areas and so you're kind of constantly reducing from the biggest area to the mm -hmm. 
smaller areas, smaller, smaller, smaller. And then you're overlaying, because the ink is opaque, um, and you, you are overlaying the color constantly. But there's games that you can play with it, technique games that you can play with it. So for example, with this one, um, you can leave the chatter so that the chatter shows, and the chatter is, are, the, are, are the sort of unintended marks. Mm -hmm. um, they're sort of unintended intentional marks um, that give texture. And you can leave that show through in some of the areas or overlap in other areas on purpose. And then and to give a sense of movement and texture in the work. And then um, as you, what happens is you only get so many prints because every time you're cutting away the block to print the next color. And, and so, uh, so ultimately you have to decide, actually you have to decide at the very beginning, I'm doing 12 prints or I'm doing 24 prints. Typically I try to start with 24. <laughs> if I'm lucky, I end up with 12 <laughs> because, you know, stuff goes wrong. And, and, uh, and, and so, or, or, you know, you're just unhappy with it or, or whatever. And so, um, so you start with, it's always a limited edition and, and you just, and you just keep cutting away the block and printing the next color. Uh, and then now that's, that's the thing, Mary Ellen, that I was, um, even though I'm barely familiar with uh, studio work on graphic arts, uh, wood blocks and such, even though I don't do that myself, never have done that. But just to try and make sure that I understand this, imagine that your wood block is like a layer cake, like a four layer cake. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the yellow was as though the whole cake was there. That's right. And then you decided that for the, the blue area, you would cut off one corner of the first I, layer. Yeah, I cut off the yellow. The, cut off the, you're the right, area so. that's yellow was the first area to get cut away. Okay, so that's what I wanted to be sure I understood. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. great, great. So um, the, say a little bit, if you will, about monotypes. So a monotype um, is actually part, actually what's behind me, the peonies, um, and we're in like peak peony season. I was, I was actually sketching and photographing those today, those in the irises. It's just been perfect weather. Um, so the, the peonies behind me, they, um, those are actually a combination of the reduction woodblock print and monotype. Oh. So the uh, so the background and the leaves are all done as reduction prints, and the monotype part is the actual flower. So the flower each each one. What I did was I went in and painted the ink, painted every single petal individually, and then did the print on it. So each one is 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 different. Uh, from that. And then once the petals were printed and I carved the petals away, leaving only the centers of the flower, and then the centers were printed on top of the monotype petals. So that's a combination print. So anytime in monotype um, is when you've manipulated, instead of just using a roller to roll the ink on top of it, um, the monotype is, is when you've gone in and like kind of individually painted the block and to get a certain effect. Well, I have to say that one of the things I've enjoyed about uh, your work and looking at it uh, in the exhibitions is that uh, I think everybody who's listening probably knows that wood blocks go back to the late Middle Ages. Uh, and so it's a very old technique in the West and even older in uh, uh, Eastern art than that. And Mary Ellen, I think you're finding a way to do new and creative uh, sort of combinations of different techniques and approaches, but in a basically realistic uh, style. So we're kind of running uh, uh, about a half an hour and I wanna leave time for questions, but I guess the last thing that I really wanna make sure that we talk a little bit about is um, why have you stuck close to realism uh, when the 20th and the 21st century are so um, full of non-objective work and uh, assemblage and now video and digital work. Why have you stuck to realism? You know, I've been thinking about that and I, I, I just have to tell you it, in the end, it, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, I kind of going full circle here. It's, it's just what you're drawn to. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, 
there, there is abstract expressionist work I absolutely love. Um, you know, I've read, I, I, I love Kandinsky. Um, you know, I, I there's, um, I love Mondrian, uh, Mondrian's trees, um, and I love his, I love Boogie Woogie Broadway, and, and the chair that he did with Riedfeld. I actually, I actually built that chair in college um, <laughs> as a project, the red and blue chair, and, uh, but don't ever buy it because you're constantly, uh, you're constantly hitting yourself on the sharp corners. It's really not made for real use. It's lovely to look at. Um, That's a nice theory. It is. It's a beautiful theory, but but by the third time you hit your knee on one of those sharp corners, you're done. You're just done with that chair. <laughs> but so, um, but I think that um, you know, I think for me, like I, I, you know, I, I don't begrudge anybody their voice. They, they, you know, you have to paint and make art as you do. And and you know, for me. There's there's so much intricacy in in the natural world, and um, realism is the tool that I need to uh, to, to find that in, to find that intricacy. Um, and and for me, it's an endless well. You know, I can get where people are like, hey, I just feel like I'm reproducing photographs. Um, and I, I get that, uh, you know, if, if people feel that way. Um, but, you know, I, for me, like uh, one of the pieces that I have actually that's in the show right now, and that's an amaryllis bulb that I just, I spent weeks drawing. Um, and I'm perfectly happy to draw little bulb tissue paper and roots and things like that. That for me is, you know, that's who I am as an artist. Um, and like I said, that's an endless well for me, but for others, I can totally get where that is. And I that's admire really, people, I'm sorry? That's really well said. And I think that that gives us a really um, uh, thorough, rounded understanding of what you are as an artist. But you told me a little anecdote. I think it was something that uh, <laughs> said to Andrew Wyeth. And yes. Great response. So why don't we you're, wrap up with that little anecdote? You're 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 a bad man. You're trying to make me offend people. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, uh, I. It, um, and and I work in a private school. I know all about not offending people. That's part of my job. <laughs> Um, no, I, um, I, I think it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant statement and it's why if it said it, you're, it, it is, it is, I, I have to, I, I have to admit, I have a sneaking admiration for curmudgeons and, and I have several dear friends who are curmudgeons because they, they, um, you know, and I admire people who are just like, oh God, just say it, you yes. know, because I'm one of these people who's like, I don't want to offend, I'm going to put it in a nice package and all of that and, and everything. But Andrew Wyeth, in, during one of his interviews, um, he said that he had a young artist come to him and, and the young artist said, you know, I've gotten to the bottom of realism and Andrew Wyeth's pithy remark was well you must be a pretty shallow guy <laughs> and and so I think that that's was, brilliant <laughs> I mean I you know but I'll tell you when you're Andrew Wyeth you can say stuff like that <laughs> but um but or, or and maybe that's not nice but I like I said I, that's why I use the imagery of of, like I, I get that it might be a shallow well for some people realism might be um but it's not for me and I I have to be honest to the, our our audience. I I wasn't really trying to take advantage of Mary Ellen and make her behave in the way that she <laughs> normally do, but I got my degree. I think I mentioned at the University of Delaware, and Andrew Wyatt's home and studio was only about thirty five miles away from campus. Yeah, and I was fortunate enough to visit both uh, his studio, uh, and I met him once on the train to New York. Uh, that's a whole another story that's not really worth telling. But the point here is I went to the University of Delaware having just written a master's thesis about Frank Stella uh, and being very suspect about um, Chad Sford, American Illustration, N.C. Wyeth, Andrew Wyatt, Howard Pyle, all those people. And after 30 years at the National Gallery of Art, I agree that Andrew White is one of the greatest American painters of the 20th century. So I, I think that he was absolutely right. And Mary Ellen, thank you for sharing that anecdote <laughs> because I think that really 
is worth hearing uh, by more people. I just wanted to know, um, have you ever worked in linoleum? Do you like that as well? Oh, that's, a, that's so nice that you asked that. Um, so I told you I took only one. This is, the, it's interesting. It's sometimes it's such a gift in life when things feel like they go full circle because I took only one semester of art in high school and I spent almost the entire semester working on a linoleum block print. It was the first thing that I ever did. And, um, and, and, it was funny because about two years ago, my mother was cleaning out, my parents were cleaning out the house that I was raised in, and my mother had found the block print that I did in high school, which was really fun. Um, so yes, I have worked in it. Um, right now, uh, what, uh, I, I work in um, linoleum uh, is, uh, I, I, I've been preferring working in wood blocks and also in something called uh, M, MD, um, MDB, which is the, the composite board, and, uh, and I've been preferring that uh, because of the de level of detail that I'm able to get, a little more detail. It's a little easier on the hands than on linoleum block. Sure. Um, and uh, if I go for linoleum block, to tell you the truth, I, I'm really fond of easy cut. I use the Speedball Easy Cut um, for some more, you know, pieces that are even just a little bit more graphic with less detail and, and things like that. But those are the main materials that I use. Um, I'm, I'm really fond of Sheena plywood, which is a Japanese uh, laminated plywood. And um, you can get some beautiful results with that. Actually, that's been my latest sort of vein that I've been taking is using Sheena plywood and doing uh, watercolor. Uh, doing watercolor printing rather than using printing on the big press. So oh. it's all hand printed. Gotcha. So can I ask one other question? Sure. Uh, wood, what type of wood do you like to use? Or is this a hardwood or a softwood? Um, actually, I've been using, uh, I've been using mostly hardwoods. Um, I, I've, I've done a series of, uh, of birds in maple and hated myself afterward for <laughs> <laughs> because my hands were so sore. I and the, see if you're cut. <laughs> yeah, they were just like so sore after that. Um, and then it was kind of funny because I think it wasn't accidental that I went to the Sheena plywood after that. And I've been working with that for a long time. So, and the Sheena is a nice balance between, um, again, between keeping the, you know, you can really keep those, those thin, uh, the, those, those thin tight lines and without having to just mangle your hands in, in doing the carving away. Gotcha. Well, that's great. I think Kendall had her hand up. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I was personally. Um, Hi. Oh, Kendall, it's okay. You've graduated. You could call me by my first name now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering how teaching art online is like how that's going right now. Oh. Like, Okay. Well, that's uh, actually, it's been going really well for me. Um, my colleagues who uh, are teaching um, photography and digital and performing arts have a lot more challenges. Um, but I, to be perfectly honest, I have St. Bob Ross. <laughs> <laughs> as my as my patron saint, um, so it's actually really helpful, and uh, I don't actually think that can be underestimated. Um, you know, uh, drawing and painting's been taught online a lot, and there are a lot of precedents for it. And and I will say, like, um, it's uh, one of the things that's great is because the mediums are simple, um, and you can do it. You can teach by demonstrating, and so that's super super helpful helpful to do that. So. I haven't had as many challenges and speed bumps as I think some artists who maybe would be working with other media would have. So it's been going well. Great, great. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Okay, Anne, Anne. one second. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> A question about uh, teaching since uh, Kendall brought that up because we're thinking about doing that here. And I wonder, I understand the demonstration just fine. But in terms of your critiquing and guiding the students, Mary Ellen, who are working on a studio art project in your class, how, how, how do you work the mechanics of that? 
It's a, that's a great question. One of the things that, that uh, I've been focusing on a lot is taking process photos. And also, and this is a really, um, one of the things that's really nice about that is documenting your process as an artist is so important. It really was I was really terrible about it up to about five years ago when I completely revamped my website. And, and I, I thought to myself, I have to do something that keeps me interested in keeping this website. And so one of the things that I did was I started a works in progress blog. And it's mainly for me to just you know, put out there like, okay, what did I do? When did I do it? How did I do it? And so what I do is I use that blog as an example. Our students uh, keep uh, an online portfolio with a free website builder called Weebly. And so what I'll have them do is take process photos and then, um, you know, and then we can, we can talk about the work and by sharing screens, we can talk about their process and uh, with that. And, and you know, it, it really really is true. Uh, like I said, I, I was just loath to do it for years and um, to sort of write about my work and write reflective pieces about my work. But, you know, lo and behold, <laughs> it's actually a good thing. <laughs> and, and I'm really, really glad that I do it because there are times where I go back now and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. That was that thing and that I wanted to do or that idea that I wanted to run with. And, and, you know, it's like keeping a sketchbook, but at the same time, when you sit down and you force yourself to say, what did I do and why did I make those choices and actually have to write that out in text, it's super helpful. So that's one of the ways that we work with the critique. We also just share, just as I did with my mouse, we share like that and, and just talk about that and talk about the work. And the, the, the rubric we use for it is called the ladder of feedback, where the students, when they look at another student's work, they have to, the first comment is something you value. The second comment is a question that you have. Um, the third comment can be a concern that you have. And the last comment can be a suggestion for the artist. So we follow that to kind of make it a safe space for critique. That was really nice, uh, Mary Ellen. I I hadn't thought about that process of teaching, but it does seem that that's very uh, well structured, but leaves open the opportunity to concentrate on the art and not on the verbal, the verbiage of it. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's this terrible thing. It's like I told you, there's no liars in the classroom. So, you know, if you're not doing it yourself, you know, the kids are going to call you out right away. And and so, you know, so you got to have it out there and be like, oh, no, see, I'm doing this. I'm taking chances. And, and one of the things I really make sure that I do is I, I post my failures. You know, it, this didn't work out the way I wanted it to. And this is why. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else have questions? I come from the opposite direction. I was in shop science, but I was drawing all the t uh, all the time when when I was a kid. If you want to really explain the reduction print that you have, very nice woodblock reduction print, you really have to show each one. Of the of the stages. My question is, how many colors were used? Okay. Oh, in this one, uh, I think this one was this one was six colors, and the one behind me was four colors, not including the petals. With with that, um, and. Uh, I'm, I'm currently working on an iguana, and um, don't ask me why it's an iguana. Uh, actually, I can tell you why it's an iguana. Um, it started out as a demo drawing that I did for my students, and I ended up like really, I knew nothing about iguanas, and then I started reading about them, and then I thought they were really interesting animals. And so I'm working on this one now, and that's probably gonna be six to eight colors. Wow. Nice, that's complicated. And there's very fine cutting in your floral and in in, in that, that you have in back of you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Julius. Yeah, I just had a quick question. <clears throat> I was looking through your website and really enjoying seeing the work that you do. 
And one of the things that I noticed that you're also doing uh, books. Uh, where are you going with that? Are you thinking about putting your work together in a handmade book? Uh, but thank you for asking it. First of all, thanks for looking at my website and thank you for asking about the books. Uh, yes, I, I just got my first book binding certificate last summer. I, uh, thanks to uh, my school is very, very supportive of professional development. And it was one of these things that I've, uh, I've had a long fascination with. And when I started doing more and more of the block printing, my mentor in that, uh, she was like, well, you know, you end up with all these extra prints. It's a good thing to learn how to make books because then you can cut up the old prints that you don't use and use them as book covers and things like that. So mm -hmm. I thought, oh, great. I'll take some little what, day long workshop, learn how to make a base, very basic one signature book and did that and kind of got hooked and then i went to pyramid atlantic and like took a series of classes there to learn how to do that um i, I was actually right before quarantine started i was just about to start um on my first leather binding um but i'll get back to that in the in the studio um but yeah i the book what i i do use my my seconds on my prints to make the books um i've done paper making and then I also make blank books and then do print making within the books so yeah. I do the Japanese block printing it's referred to as mokuhanga which is where those are the ones that I do on the sheen of plywood and then print them in the book um, and so then I have accordion books that are entire long scenes done in that sort of Japanese uh, manga sketchbook style mm -hmm. uh, and doing that. So yeah, I've been really enjoying uh, combining the printmaking and the bookmaking. It's, it's, it's a great, it's again, another deep well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we're pretty close to an hour now. So maybe we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up. One sec. I'm Where do you show your work besides okay. MFA? Oh, um, well, I've been showing my work. Um, I, I've been showing my work at a small gallery uh, called um, the Equinox Gallery in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I'm also a member at the Torpedo Factory uh, in the Art League. And then uh, I just I just recently um, I, 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 that was actually super exciting because I was like, oh, these people are, are really great. I'm, I'm not going to get in. And I got in and I, I had taken a class there and then was invited as a student to become a member at the gallery. So that was super, super exciting. It was just a couple months ago. And um, I've also been showing my work at a small gallery called the Main Street Gallery up in Elmira, New York. Um, it, it, I don't know, I, I, it, it, it's, it's funny. My husband's very fond of teach, teasing me. One of our favorite movies is, um, it's, a, uh, is uh, it's a Wonderful Life. And if you recall, the, uh, the, the tax auditor is always trying to get home to Elmira. <laughs> And so he's like, well, it's great. You got a following in Elmira. <laughs> but you know, you got to take what you get can get, you know? <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, and I thank you all for tuning in. And I hope you'll join us next week when I talk with another member of the MFA, uh, Mike McSorley, who is a wonderful painter, who happens to also mostly work in a realist approach. Uh, but um, Mary Ellen, thanks. You've been a great uh, guest and uh, it's been really fascinating for me to hear what you have to say about yourself and about your work. So thanks uh, so much. I really appreciate it. Well, it was great I, to meet everybody. Okay. Thank you all. See you next week, I hope. Bye-bye. Yeah.